Hello and welcome once again to my presentation on case study number five titled Caught Between Two Cultures that we will look at through the approach of Bronf and Brenner. I once again chose this case study because I am a foreign language teacher and culture is a very important aspect of language and the two concepts are intertwined. So welcome to my presentation. So this case study is written by a man named Steve. He is a black man whose parents are from Trinidad. A little information about Trinidad. It is an island in the Caribbean, which is located seven miles off the coast of Venezuela and has a population of 1.3 million. The people of Trinidad are diverse, hospitable, and proud of their vibrant multicultural fusion in food and customs. Steve grew up, however, in the United States because his father had moved to the United States in order to attend Howard University in Washington, D.C. He then met his mother, who is originally also from Trinidad, and then they moved to Nashville shortly after Steve was born. Steve struggled throughout his life to fit into Black American culture because he was not raised in the same ethnic culture as many Black Americans. So in this paper, I will analyze his adolescence and his struggle to find his place in American culture using the psychological approach of Bronfen Brenner's ecological theory of human development. By now we are all familiar with Bronfen Brenner and his PPCT theory. And so as we go through the paper, we will talk about the elements of his theory, which include process, person, context, and time. So as we look at process, the regular interaction between persons in one's immediate environment, that of course includes the family. First of all, Steve has a younger brother, Drew, who he said was his constant companion during adolescence. He also maintained a close relationship with him throughout his life, which he said gave him a sense of not feeling alone in his identity struggle. He claimed that only his brother could truly understand what it was like to be Caribbean, American, and Black. His father, certainly was a strong influence in his life. His father was an intelligent man, strong, ambitious. He became a doctor. He also talked about how his father grew up in an all-black environment, having, quote, no sense of a rabid collective enemy and not really having to deal with the issues of racism when he grew up in Trinidad. His father held very high expectations for him and held back praise. At one point in his writing, Steve talks about the moment that he actually felt accepted by his father and that his father was proud of him when he gave him a card when he graduated from high school. But other than that, his father was very emotionally distant and he spent a lot of his adolescence trying to gain his father's unconditional approval. He felt that his father cared more about showing off his perfect family than actually having a good relationship with his children. His father was definitely the more authoritarian one, and both of his parents were slightly controlling and trying to direct where he would choose to go to college, the type of career he would have. Um, his mother even at one point advised him that he should date white girls because he would not be able to relate to black women. He doesn't talk as much about his mother, but she was also demanding with high expectations more authoritative than authoritarian. He does talk about that his parents argued a lot with each other. There was a lot of conflict between them. He also does say that at one point he became close to his mom when she was refereeing soccer, when he was involved in soccer, but that they still differed on many ideas. His relationship with his brother Drew was really important as I mentioned before. So his family, his family support system was not all negative, but he dealt with a lot of repressed emotions. The neighborhood in which Steve grew up along with his school environments also provided influential interactions with his peers. 
Steve made friends easily in the white suburban neighborhood where he lived. He interacted with black friends only on occasion. He attended a private middle school where he gravitated towards the nerds because he said he knew he was different from other black children that he met. That is, that he knew that he was from a different culture. At some point during his elementary years, he tried to fit in with the standard black culture by listening to popular music, trying to live up to the stereotypes that black people have rhythm and are good athletes. But he felt intimidated by his black peers because he knew he couldn't live up to their cultural expectations of acceptable behavior, so he ended up avoiding them. Furthermore, he felt that his white peers at the private school that he attended didn't truly see him as black because he was the son of a doctor and he was privileged. Also, his proper English accent, which he had from Trinidad, carried, carried a barrier for forming relationships with black peers. Um, he says that his black peers would often tell him he was trying to be too white and too proper. Steve switched to a magnet school after middle school and avowed to immerse himself in the black culture in order to get in touch with his identity as a black man. He was also very skilled at soccer, having picked that up in Trinidad from um, the Trinidadian culture, which is very popular there. And so he joined a soccer team and formed, ended up forming a close relationship with his coach, whom he considered his second father. In this relationship, Steve was able to open up about his repressed feelings, which boosted his self-esteem. Additionally, his soccer prowess led to admiration and popularity with peers, which also contributed to a positive sense of self. Eventually, he did feel accepted and respected at his high school and interacted in black and white social circles, although he felt more comfortable in white social groups. He experienced peer pressure because he got good grades and achieved at high levels, and his black peers would accuse him of acting white, but the culture he grew up in stressed academic success, so he didn't allow himself to be negatively persuaded. During high school, he also had a girlfriend, along with a few close friends who were mostly women. He was accepted by his black peers, but maintained a diverse circle of friends, staying closest to women, because he found it easier to relate to them. As I mentioned earlier, his mother advised that he should try to find a white American girl to date because he wouldn't relate to American blacks. Steve actually claims that he was afraid of black women because they acted differently than his mother, who was the only black woman who acted in a certain way, and therefore he avoided romantic relationships with black women. So moving on to the person aspect of Bronson Brunner's theory, we will talk about the personal characteristics that Steve brought with him into social situations. First, his demand characteristics, the most important and impactful to his struggle of identity is the fact that he is a black male, which made him stand out in the white community that he was raised in. It also carried stereotypical expectations by his black peers. As far as resource characteristics, he had more than adequate access to food, supportive parents, educational opportunities, including access to a to private schools with excellent resources. And he was able to succeed in academics and eventually pursue a career in medicine like his dad. He had strong mental resources, a bright, bright man who excelled in school and was accepted into college for medicine. His emotional resources were certainly lacking, particularly from his father, but he managed to reach out and find support from his soccer coach, his brother, and his close friends, particularly female friends. His force characteristics um, consist of temperament, motivation, and persistence. We know that Steve was a bit shy and mingled in small social groups in his early adolescence, but eventually he became more comfortable socializing with males in multicultural groups. He formed close relationships with white, black, Jewish, and Hispanic peers, although his preference was always the white females. He was always motivated to succeed academically due to his parents' demands and expectations, which were rooted in his Trinidadian heritage. Finally, he was persistent and persevered through his repressed emotions and being the feeling of being caught between two cultures by reaching out to his coach, forming bonds with his peers, and exploring his racial heritage and excelling in soccer. Next, we'll take a look at context, including the microsystem, exosystem, and macrosystem. Steve's microsystem included his home, neighborhood, and school environments. 
His home environment was stable, but he also experienced conflict, as his parents often argued, and his father was emotionally unavailable. He did have a close bond with his brother, which was beneficial. His parents did not encourage his development of personal autonomy by trying to control his choices in relationships and academics, but they also didn't outright hinder his autonomy. The school environments he was in offered excellent academic options, opportunities to interact with other privileged students, and eventually with a more diverse peer group. His exosystem involves environmental influences that have an indirect effect on a person. So Steve's exosystem included his parents' cultural and educational experiences, which had an effect on his own expectations and attitudes toward behavior and academics. For example, his father was a highly educated doctor. Steve followed in his footsteps to pursue a career in medicine. His mother's views on race also influenced his relationships. He claims that his parents were culturally naive in the United States because they had not grown up in American society and didn't truly grasp his struggle with ethnic identity. Finally, his affluent neighborhood and early school environment affected his identity because he was mostly surrounded by white people, and his parents didn't make explicit efforts for him to mingle with blacks. Finally, the macro system includes the culture in which one lives. Because Steve lived in a Trinidadian family with values consistent with that heritage, he also, though, had to grow up in a predominantly white neighborhood. His family was very prosperous, and it does appear that he was brought up in a time in the U.S. when racial inequality was less of a roadblock. However, he did face racial stereotypes from his black peers that he couldn't live up to. Additionally, he himself bought into the racial stereotypes that many white people hold of American black people. He states, quote, I really had no clue as to who I was and what it meant to be a black American. He also claims that he felt a, quote, significant amount of pressure toward assimilation with white people due to the fact that his parents had not fully experienced racism that some black adolescents do in the United States. Cultural expectations still abound in regard to how white and black Americans are supposed to act, and Steve struggled with those expectations because although he is black, he felt like a white person in American society. He stated, quote, I wasn't really black. I had the skin color, but my family acted differently, and I lived in a white neighborhood where I had mostly white friends. Finally, we'll look at the time aspect of Bronfen Brunner's PPCT theory, micro, meso, and macro time. Um, first, the micro time, referring to what happens during this course of a specific interaction, including his interactions with his father, mother, brother, and peers. And we know that his interactions with his father were painful, and his interactions with his mother were, as we know, somewhat limited, although she seemed to be a little more accessible than his dad. Excellent interactions with his brother and mixed interactions with his peers. Mesotime refers to interactions that occur with some consistency involving his ongoing interactions with his family members and peers, particularly, again, his lack of connection with his dad, ongoing closeness with his brother, and both positive and negative interactions with his diverse peers. He always felt comfortable around white people but felt difficulty relating to black people. Finally, macro time refers to how developmental processes vary according to historical events in one age or another. There didn't appear to be any major historical events that occurred during Steve's adolescence that played a major role in his development based on the context of the reading, but there were plenty of cultural influences, as we talked about earlier, that shaped his identity in regard to racial stereotypes. As we conclude, we can say that Steve's adolescence was heavily impacted by the cultural influences of the society in which he was raised, which conflicted with his skin color and his parents' native Trinidadian culture. He adopted the social normative influences of his white suburban neighborhood by prescribing to social norms. He, when he attempted to act more like his black peers they, that he used as a reference group to learn the acceptable ways to gain praise, at one point he did that, but he kind of failed. Um, social power was also a factor in Steve's life because he was more likely to observe and imitate the behavior of those who control his resources, such as his parents and close friends. He did not conform to the stereotypes of his black peers and fulfilled his need to belong by finding ways to connect with diverse friends. 
Additionally, Steve's parents were strict and limited. Some of his ability to make his own decisions, but research does show that adolescents with strict but responsive parents end up developing healthier peer relationships as he did. Because Steve's parents weren't really conscious about the stereotype threat that exists for black American males, Steve didn't underachieve or allow negative stereotypes to affect his behavior. He did have to endure the ridicule of acting white at times throughout his life, which led to a confusing sense of personal identity. While Steve always knew he was black, he felt white due to the environments and social norms that he grew up in. After reading this case study, I can name three of the main issues within Bronson Brunner's PPCT theory that most affected him. That would include the proximal processes of interacting with those in his microsystem, his access to material resources, and the cultural influences of the environment in which he was raised. I wonder if Steve had been raised in Trinidad like his parents, he probably wouldn't have experienced the type of racial identity crisis that he did here in the United States. He was forced to deal with his skin color and racial stereotypes after being raised and educated in the fluent white region. He struggled to reconcile that being black did not mean that he belonged to a geographic culture of black Americans. Furthermore, because he was raised by affluent, successful, and demanding parents who held high expectations for him, it was an advantage, but also a disadvantage when he tried to relate to his black peers who often grew up in poverty and without strong parental influences. Finally, the cultural influences of the white and black cultures in his secondary school played a major role in his struggle to be accepted by peers, but ultimately his worst characteristics contributed to his ability to form healthy relationships with others and become more confident in his identity. This case study furthers the discussion regarding race, culture, and ethnicity, and the role of proximal processes in adolescent identity development. And just as an anecdotal ending, um, I used to work in an urban school setting where 90% of our student body was Hispanic, and I quickly learned that just because someone is Hispanic doesn't mean that they have the same culture. And you could certainly see the differences between, for example, adolescents who came from Puerto Rico versus those who came from Mexico versus those um, who came from Colombia. They all have differing cultural ideas and social norms. And that is a really interesting dynamic. So my question here for all of us is, how can minority ethnic groups overcome stereotype threat and the criticism of acting white? Thank you again for listening.